This week, the robots helping children through lockdown. This is a penny. Love is in the air. Omar's helping you keep it there. And remember, hands, face, space. Hey, welcome to Click. Hope you're doing okay. Now, for many people, the change in our routines over the last year, our working arrangements and our personal lives has been pretty challenging. Speaking personally, I have a massive fear of change. And I don't know about you, Laura, but even when I was a kid, going from school to the school summer holidays was pretty daunting, just having six weeks of no plans. And then going back to school after the holidays, that was pretty terrifying too. Oh, I remember it well. Changes in routine can throw any of us, whatever they are, and it can take a little while to get back into the rhythm. Yeah, and for neurodiverse children, this whole thing has been so much more difficult. And the last 12 months has affected each and every one of them differently. Yes, and the differences can be really extreme. I've heard stories of autistic kids in lockdown who've really struggled with the lack of a structured school day. But I've also heard stories of those who've really flourished without the pressures of an unpredictable day at school. And um, when you can't go out and see people, you also can't get the professional support that you might have been able to get before. You can't even see familiar faces and familiar friends. Now we are learning more and more about neurodiversity and would you believe that robots are now helping some children on the autistic spectrum? New devices can speak, play and teach kids and help them to learn practical and social skills and Paul Carter has been finding out more. Oh, he came towards you! Wow! <laughs> Say go Bubbles! This is Ethan. He's nine years old and is autistic. Is he your friend? Yes. He lives with his mum, Christina, in Pennsylvania. Hey, Ethan. Hi, Bubbles. This little robot entered his life three months ago. It's been named Bubbles. This is one of my favourite times of the day when I get to play with you. The cabby robot itself was built in Taiwan, but it's been programmed with more than 100 special education lessons and games by Movia Robotics in the US. Oh, clean. Very good. They put everything in the system, but then I get to choose what he does that day for the session. Um, Mother Pig. Nice talking. Bye. Ethan was non-verbal until age six, but can now say several words at a time. A lot of the times when Bubble speaks and he asks Ethan something, um, Ethan will actually repeat what the robot said, or he'll repeat what the answer is. Let's do a new activity. One coin exercise has gone down particularly well. This is a penny. He's able to recognize what coins are and what they're called. So there was four different coins. Nichols. Dad Nichols. Yes! And so just like that, we had never taught him that. And so he is learning that directly from Bubbles. And dance parties help break up tasks, complete with robot dance moves, of course. <laughs> I like it. Now, it's Bubbles' physicality that makes all the difference. Ethan hugs the robot. He will say good morning to it. He'll say good night and bye bye bubbles as if it is a friend or a family member. So I just don't think you get that relationship and that connection through an iPad. And I don't know how you'd get that from a flat screen. But bubbles isn't the first robot used to help autistic children. The last 20 years has seen a growing body of research with bots in all shapes and sizes. Well, we do know from a great many small-scale studies is that human-robot interaction, in particular child-robot interaction with well-designed robots, uh, can result and often does result in improved verbalization, improved social skills, improved learning, um, initiating play, initiating joy and attention. All my birds, in fact, are descended This robot from has been specially robots. built Light. over the past Tiny five years to teach social and cognitive skills. And yes, it's an owl. We wanted it to not evoke humanity in particular, 
because that can be off-putting for many children on the spectrum. We also wanted it to look like something that could be very smart. Owls are thought to be smart. The child would listen to the robot, trust it as an authority and engage with it because the robot was a tutor and a friend. Kiwi doesn't just look smart, it is smart. It teaches kids maths while responding to their behavior. Where are the happy faces? Can you count them? To interact with any human for any period of time, it takes intelligent AI. Um, so just to know if the child is even in the frame and hasn't walked away takes intelligence. How do you know that the child is engaged? Are they performing? Are they taking turns? Are they making eye contact? This is all AI. <sighs> a pioneer in her field, Maya also co-founded Moxie, a soon-to-ship robot that has been backed by Amazon. Riley. It's nice to meet you, Riley. I love stories. Would you read a story to me? What we haven't seen yet is real life products in the home with evidence over a period of, let's say, a year. Riley, we have a new mission. Would you make a drawing for me? Ultimately, that evidence right. will end up coming from products likely sooner than it will come from research. But bringing robots out of purely academic settings is expensive. Ethan's robot from Movia Robotics starts at $800 a pop. The Moxie comes with a pre-order price tag of $1,700. And SoftBank Robotics' Now Robot, first used by autistic children around a decade ago, costs more than $8,000. So are they really worth the expense? So there are more and more of these innovations hitting the market. So when you're dealing with another human being, you have to think about their tone of voice, you have to think about their body language. Have, there's lots and lots of information that is involved in an interaction with another person. Um, so, it, so tech can help by simplifying those things. But importantly, no one should see a robotic aid as a silver bullet. Just because something worked for one family, it doesn't mean it will work for someone else. Don't take really rash decisions because you could be using that money on a piece of tech when actually what your child needs is more support from an occupational therapist or a speech and language therapist. Maybe that it's helpful for special schools to try out some of this equipment before parents rush, in, rush to purchase them. Movia Robotics has rolled out 160 systems across schools, therapy organisations and homes around the world. The team says early testing in US schools has seen some kids improve by up to 20% across their verbal, attention and academic skills. For Ethan and Christina, Bubbles has been a worthwhile purchase. So for us, um, it's been extremely life-changing. I mean, there's really no other way to describe it. One, two, three. <gasps> four! He gets four thumbs up from us. Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was a week that brought more bad news for beleaguered games outfit CD Projekt Red. On top of Cyberpunk 2077's bug-laden launch, the company's been hacked in a ransomware attack. In a statement, CD Projekt said, we will not give in to the demands or negotiate. A rogue Zoom filter made a US lawyer in Texas appear as a cute little kitten during a live court appearance. I'm here live, but it's not, I'm not a cat. Uh, I, can, I can see that. And in the UK, MPs are wading into the PlayStation 5 Xbox Series X debate. They're not bothered which one is better though. Scottish National Party MP Douglas Chapman is proposing making it illegal for online scalpers to use automated bots to scoop up next-gen consoles from online retailers before genuine customers have even clicked add to cart. Reddit claims it's blown its entire marketing budget, taking out a blink and you'll miss it, five-second ad during the US Super Bowl. The ad tips a nod to the GameStop stockbroking amateurs who organise via Reddit to outwit professional hedge funds. And finally, the value of Bitcoin has risen dramatically, with one Bitcoin now worth more than £34,000. This week, Elon Musk's car company Tesla revealed it had purchased £1.1 billion worth of the cryptocurrency earlier this year. The automaker plans to accept Bitcoin as payment in future. The move has raised eyebrows in some quarters though, with industry observers questioning Tesla's green credentials after investing in a currency which requires a lot of energy to produce. The skies above Mars are about to get even busier. Engine ignition, two. 
as three different spacecraft from three different nations close in on the red planet within just over a week of each other. In pole position, the United Arab Emirates' first interplanetary probe, HOPE, arrived in orbit on Tuesday, met by huge celebrations in the region. Close behind was China's Tianwen-1, arriving just one day later. It's their first successful journey to another planet. And whilst the UAE's probe will only orbit Mars, China's will detach a lander and a rover to head down to the surface in May. And finally, on the 18th of February, NASA's Perseverance rover will attempt to make a daring landing. But landing the rover is a massive undertaking and so much needs to go right. This is what's known as the seven minutes of terror. The spacecraft will hit the top of the Martian atmosphere at 12,000 miles per hour, but it needs to come to a complete stop and then lower the rover gently onto the ground just seven minutes later and all completely autonomously. But to find out more about all of these missions, I spoke to Elizabeth Seward, Airbus Defence and Space's senior space strategist. So we've got three spacecraft all getting to Mars at pretty much the same time. Why is that? So as Mars and the Earth orbit around the Sun, you can imagine them like races on a racetrack. Earth is the inside one and it's going quite fast and Mars is the outside one and it's going quite slowly. And so every two years they line up. So just before they line up is when you want to launch from Earth and then the spacecraft catches up with Mars and then it can land on Mars. If we tried to do it any other time, the distances between the planets would be so great that we would not be able to put enough rocket fuel on the rocket to get them there. So we have this two year window um, and so every two years we can launch spacecraft. And so there's often a queue. It's happened before in the 70s as well, four at once, three at once. Um, and so this time we're seeing three at once. So China's now landed a probe on the far side of the moon and now it's landing its first rover on Mars. It sounds to me like China's catching up with the US in terms of space. The Chinese um, space exploration is, has just hugely uh, increased in pace recently. And you could say catching up, you could even say outpacing. Nobody else has landed on the far side of the moon yet. So that was a world first. They're not the only ones entering into space though. Uh, we saw the Indian um, nation launch a probe to Mars and so they have their satellite in orbit already and um, we're talking about the UAE today and there are many other countries now able to access space so yeah it's really exciting. There's a real fleet of spacecraft in orbit around Mars now isn't there? There's loads of them. The future is, is full of Mars missions um, the Perseverance rover that's landing is going to collect samples and leave them in little caches, little sealed tubes, um, wherever it finds them. So they're going to be dotted around the surface. And then in, in Europe, in fact, in Stevenage in the UK, we're currently designing the Sample Fetch rover, which I'm sure will have a snappy name by the time it gets to Mars. Um, and that's going to go around and trundle after it and pick up all of these samples. After the rover's picked them all up, it's going to put them inside a, a baseball size canister. It gets shot off the Martian surface by a Mars ascent vehicle. And then the baseball uh, canister has to be captured by our spacecraft uh, called um, the Earth Return Orbiter to bring them home. And so what you will have is, is literally a baseball catch in orbit <laughs> so that it can bring those samples back to Earth. Getting spacecraft to Mars is an incredible achievement, but with the perils of exploration, sample returns and data collection still to take place, these missions are just the beginning. phone, hand sanitizer and face mask. Face masks have become one of the essential items for when we leave the house. So I've been taking a look at some of the more unusual ones. First up is mask phone. It's got built-in earphones and a microphone so you can make phone calls without sounding muffled by your mask. 
I often catch up with friends whilst I'm out doing my exercise, so if I'm going to be wearing a mask, then of course I could wear separate earphones, but it was quite convenient to have them built in, and the person I called said I sounded good and not at all muffled. On a windier day, it may have helped with that too. But in terms of the fabric mask itself, great that it's machine washable and you just slip in an N95 filter, but personally, this isn't my chosen type of mask, and I thought it could do with being a bit longer so I could pull it further under my chin. Next up is AirPops Active Plus Halo Smart Mask. A lot of people who wear single-use masks don't actually dispose of them after every use, and likewise, a lot of people wearing masks that need the filters replacing aren't actually replacing the filters as often as they should. This mask has sensors inside this silver button that measure your breathing rate. The app then combines that with local air quality data to alert you when you need to replace the filter. Before putting in a new filter, you need to use the app to scan the QR code. That will both ensure that the filter is genuine and also make a note of when it's been put in. The mask itself feels very much like the 3D knit fabric of high-end trainers, so it's tough and it's breathable. Now, I'm told that it'll offer N99 protection, so that's greater than N95. It'll keep out aerosols, liquids and pollution. The app was only in beta when I tested it, but it accurately recorded how long I'd been wearing the mask. I personally found the mask itself a better fit than the mask foam one, and longer term, the focus on this product is to protect you from poor air quality. That is, of course, a smaller mask-wearing market, although it could be a growing one. Next up is UV Mask. Now, I was quite surprised by how bulky this mask was when it arrived, as it feels rather hefty to wear. But that's because inside it hides ultraviolet UVC LEDs. They aim to kill bacteria and viruses for up to eight hours of wear. The companies assured me that the UVC is safe as it never reaches your skin, and also that the device doesn't create any ozone, so it's not going to be causing a problem for air quality. Now, when I first put the mask on, it was actually surprisingly comfortable. The only thing was that it does make a bit of sound, and I felt a little bit of air coming out here that was tickling my eyes. I was very conscious of all of that whilst I was indoors, but as soon as I went outside, I did stop noticing. At that point, it was just a matter of having to get used to wearing something so solid on my face, and there did come a point where I was quite relieved to take it off. And here's a prototype by gaming company Razer. Its Project Hazel mask was revealed at CES in January. Its see-through design features what it calls active ventilation to prevent CO2 build up in the mask. It also has a microphone and its charging case has UV light inside for sterilization. For many, these ideas may be a bit of over-engineering, but if you're looking for a mask with a difference and you're willing to pay for it, then one of these might just appeal. Being in lockdown can have its challenges, either because we are forced together for much longer than usual or because we're away from our partners. So, this Valentine's Day, I'm going to be spending it with no one. I'm single right now. But I'm baking myself a Valentine's cake, lemon flavour, just to, you know, give myself some love. But even if I found my soulmate tomorrow, I don't think it would be all happiness and roses forever. I reckon it probably takes quite a bit to keep the flame alive. Alex and I have been together for 10 years in total. We uh, have lots of adventures together uh, normally, um, but obviously under lockdown circumstances, you were experiencing the same thing together all day, every day. It came to the end of our tenancy with we rent in the property, and I knew that we couldn't afford the next month's rent. I uh, had to get the house. Uh, just as parents were great, um, they let us stay there as long as needed. That helped us financially get back on our feet. And so since the beginning of the lockdown, um, we have been together throughout. Uh, we, we've spent no time apart. It, it got to a point where we were just breathing was annoying each other. <laughs> we were into each other's way um, a lot. Well, 
As gloomy as this may seem, there is an app out there that can help you keep the communication alive. Paired launched last year with a basic and the premium version that you have to pay for. You're given topics to chat about each day. It's only once you've given your own answers that you can see your partners, prompting a conversation about it afterwards, gamifying the experience to help you get to know each other better and how you're feeling. It makes you question it, it makes you ask it, it makes you talk, it ask your thoughts. It reminds you that you, you have so much more in common and that you enjoy each other's company pre-children because it's so easy when you've got young children to only talk to each other about your children. For Tom, who has cerebral palsy, the stresses of lockdown caused him to suffer more pain than usual. That and restrictions have meant that he's not always been there to support Jess during her pregnancy. We, we, we come from different backgrounds. Um, I mean, I've got a family and I'm good, but I'm not as close. So to me, it was, I thought she was just weird and she thought I was weird. <laughs> I like gaming, PC, PlayStation, which Jess could understand. And she's actually, she's willing to give it a try. That was our next thing. It's made us understand each other. Um, and then if you understand something, it doesn't upset you. For Felicia and Alex, it's prompted a different level of conversation and seeing what they can do for each other during lockdown. I think when you first start dating someone, you have lots of kind of philosophical or theoretical conversations. You know, what would you do if this happened? Or um, what would be your last meal? I remember asking Alex that. And actually it takes something external to prompt you into engaging in those kind of conversations again. It's a kind of a fun tool, but also it prompted me to, to appreciate and realize that I actually hadn't done any meals for Felicia or the kids during the whole week and and therefore it kind of prompted me to, to make sure that I made an effort. But why do you need technology to tell you what should really be common sense? You should always continue to work on your relationship as a couple. Otherwise, you know, stagnant becomes not exciting and potentially dangerous. This app made me see differently. Um, I like the way it kind of prompts you. And if, if, the, if I don't do it, the apps prompt me, then Jess has prompted me to answer the question. So I don't know where we'd be. I, I'd hate to know. We've got a baby here now, so I'm happy we're together and, you know, we're a family. Seems like in the best circumstances, this kind of app can help people both have their cake and uh, eat it. <laughs> But from what I've seen, this is just one of several out there trying to get couples to communicate more. For instance, the Toucan app, which claims it can take the pulse of your relationship, map it out and give couples practical tools. And then there's Between Us, just recently launched by couples therapy organization Tavistock Relationships. It's said to dig a bit deeper to help couples better understand the roots of their problems. But can these apps really help solve the deeper issues of a relationship? The apps are very good at um, prompting communication. It doesn't really tell you how to do it. And it can't replace the therapist who's actually in the room noticing the dynamic between the couple and helping them to take care of themselves and to improve the way they communicate by actually coaching them through that. So these apps may not be an instant fix. They still require a lot of effort and communication from the couple to get the best out of them, but they still can be useful. I might give them a try myself one day. Well, when I'm dating again. <laughs>